Hi, uh, I'm Tim Moss. I'm the Chief Executive Officer and Comptroller General at the UK Intellectual Property Office uh, and talk to you on IP Fridays. Hello and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 114 of IP Fridays. Together with my co-host Ken Suzanne, we wish you happy holidays and a better year 2021 than this year. Today's interview guest is Tim Moss, the CEO of the UK Intellectual Property Office, and we will talk about Brexit and what that means for owners of patents, trademarks and designs. Tim has been a guest of this podcast earlier in episode 109 earlier this year, and we already had talked about all the most important rules uh, that will change and all the things that will change when the UK finally departs the EU. And today we talk about all the things that developed since then. The World Intellectual Property Office, WIPO, in Switzerland has published their World Intellectual Property Indicators Report. And in this report, they always uh, every year state how many patent applications and trademark applications and so on are filed. So the overall number of patent applications decreased slightly from 2018. There were 3,325,400 patent applications filed worldwide and in 2019 that number was 3,224,200 so a minus of 3%. Um, but uh, in contrast to that, the trademark registrations and uh, trademark applications rose by about 6% and the number of designs that have been filed increased slightly by 1.3%. Most notably, the China's, uh, China's IP office has received 1.4 million patent applications in 2019, more than twice the amount received by authorities in the second busiest country, namely the US, with 621,000 patent applications. Also, Canada and the European Patent Office agreed to enter into a patent prosecution highway agreement. That means the results of one office in examination will be accepted by the other office in simple words. So if a patent in Canada has been granted and then is filed before the European Patent Office, it can be easily granted there if you invoke the Patent Prosecution Highway Agreement and the other way around. Now let's jump into the interview with Tim Moss, the CEO of the UK Intellectual Property Office. Welcome to today's episode of IP Fridays. Today's interview guest is Tim Moss. If you don't know who Tim is, Tim is the Chief Executive Officer and Comptroller General of the UK's Intellectual Property Office, and he's responsible for advising ministers on all IP policy matters and for the operation of the whole office. And he was also already guest on our show, IP Fridays, in January in episode 109. Thank you for being back, Tim. Thank, thank you, Rolf. Uh, I'm delighted to be back uh, and great to be able to talk to you again. And uh, uh, it's uh, an awful lot has happened uh, since we spoke last. So uh, it's been quite a year um, and uh, certainly you know, um, an awful lot gone on and uh, a big impacts in the world of IP. So great to be here again. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful that you took the time. It must be very busy at the moment for you. <laughs> uh, it, it is It is very busy and uh, it's been a, a dramatic year, but yeah, in, incredibly busy. The office is, is uh, working flat out um, and in particular in the trademarks area where we're seeing record volumes. Um, we saw a slight dip in the start of the pandemic, but since then, um, it's uh, actually it, uh, trademarks of volumes have gone through the roof. We were, we're actually at 20 five percent above our forecast and 46 percent above where we were last year and a lot of that is Whoa. is innovation <laughs> and uh, new people did people doing new businesses new new business models a lot more online business and people looking to register trademarks and as we get close to the 31st of december um people preparing for uh, the big change at the end of transition um period for the uk uh, leaving the eu 
thank you so much for this uh, quick update already. <laughs> That's very impressive. Um, so um, since we last talked, you already mentioned that uh, a lot of a lot has changed and has been a very busy year. Um, do you know uh, what what would be the most important changes that happened in the IP world with regard to UK and especially Brexit? Um, well, I think you know. Uh, uh, yeah. The, the end of the transition period is, is seeing that the, 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 a huge change for the UK and the UK IPO, especially you know, all the Brexit related issues. Um, and I think you know, the most important thing um, for uh, to message to get out to your listeners is you know, we are ready. And we're prepared for the end of transition and um, the fact that you know, the world of IP in the UK does change a bit. Um, some bits stay the same. So largely patents as, as stay the same. Um, most copyright things uh, remain the same too, although there's one or two cross-border mechanisms that, that do change at the end of transition. But by far and away, the biggest change is around trademarks and, and community designs, where the system you know, uh, ceases uh, to cover the UK on the 31st of December. And at that point, we'll have a very busy new year, just creating well over 2 million rights um, uh, for the 1st of January. Um, and I think the, the, the really important thing for, for listeners is, you know, the rights are secure, um, both from a legislative point of view and all the operational uh, elements that uh, are in train to make sure that happens. And it will happen automatically at no cost. Um, and so on the 1st of January, anyone that has a European trademark or registered community design will have two, tr two trademarks and two registered community designs, one covering the 27 member states and one covering the UK. Um, and so that will be happening. But as I said, a huge change for us and certainly we'll have a lot, of, a lot of people working very hard over the new year. It'll be slightly different for them. They won't be parting. They'll be working hard to make sure this all happens smoothly um, for everybody. But um, that's the most important thing for everyone to, um, to, to be aware of and to say, look, that's the, that's the big change. Um, lots of work. Yes. Yes, we already know the numbers. That's really kind of you to have a very convenient numbering scheme. So we already have all the new designs and trademarks in our system here in our law firm. <laughs> Great. Well, we wanted to try and make it as simple for people as possible. As I said, automatic, no cost, simple numbering system. Make it easy for people um, to, to, to cope with the, the, the change. I mean, there have been one or two other things that have, have developed through the year since we last spoke. Um, and probably one of the, the, the important ones is around UK address for service. Um, where uh, we, we've published some business guidance um, uh, and that followed a, a sort of the, the government response to a call for views that we had earlier in the year. Um, and, and basically from the 1st of January, um, you know, once the, all the legislation has gone through, uh, only an address for service in the UK, which also includes the Isle of Man, Gibraltar, Channel Islands, will be accepted for new applications um, and new requests to start uh, proceedings at the, uh, the IPO. So Big change, but something that people really need to be aware of. And that applies for across all rights, you know, patents, trademarks and designs. Yeah, there's uh, there's one question I have for that. Um, um, typically, we validate the patents, uh, the European patents, and then we just uh, write to the UK IPO. Here we are the representatives of the UK right. Uh, please register us as the address for service. Um, that will no longer be possible, I guess. So validation of patents needs to have the, um, a representative validating uh, the patent in the UK will need an address in the UK, right? Uh, I think on 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 patents, um, you know, European patents you know, that have a UK designation, you know, take effect automatically in the UK, uh, and that's been the case for for, for some time. Um, and so, since translation requirements were waived a few years ago, there, there's no actual val validation step. Um, once the address for rules change on the 1st of January, that uh, remains true. Um, and it's not necessary to supply a UK address for service for, it to, to, for the, European pat the European patent to take effect, um, nor is it necessary for renewal. Um, however, you will need to supply a UK address for service if you want to do anything else in relation to the patent. So if you want to make an amendment, a correction, start proceedings, etc., then you will need the address for service. Um, but All as I right. said, th yes. these are, you know, there, there is guidance available. Um, and if people have got any questions or concerns, to first port is to, is to look at the guidance we've got on our website. Um, but uh, then uh, if they've got any other, other questions than that, please do, do ask. Yes, and I, I guess the safest bet would be to have an address for service in the UK or give you an address for service in the UK in, just in case, for example, the patent would be attacked by revocation proceedings or anything. <coughs> so, um, so someone would be notified. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, thank you very much. That is a very helpful uh, answer. 
Um, one more question regarding patents. Um, the German Parliament uh, finally voted again on the topic of the Unified Patent Court, um, and Germany is now expected <coughs> to ratify the agreement soon, the UPC agreement. Um, do you think it would be possible for the UK to stay in the UPC system? Um, that would of obviously be a very good advantage for the applicants of European patents. And if yes, how do you think that would be possible? Um, I, I I mean, there, a lot of work's gone on in terms of the UP and UPC, and again, that's been a, a big year for that this this year. Um, but the UK did uh, has made a statement uh, earlier this year saying that it's not seeking to have involvement in the UP or UPC system um, going forward. You know, participation in the court, you know, does mean that uh, various aspects of, of EU law um, uh, apply and uh, would need to be bound by the CJEU. And that's not consistent with the UK's aims of becoming a sort of independent, self-governing nation. So uh, we're not we are not looking to to um, take part in the UP, UPC. Um, and uh, in terms of how that will develop going forward, that will be for the remaining members of, of, of the European UPC to decide how that goes forward. Um, so okay. that's that, mm -hmm. that, that's we're quite clear on on how that that's working for for, for the foreseeable future. And I I would guess that that will also cover the the seat of the UPC. One of the three <coughs> seats is in London. Would that stay there or would that be given up? Uh, I mean, regarding the future location of, of of that seat, I mean that is a matter for the remaining states to 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 decide. Obviously, we've been involved in, in setting up the, the, the seat in London, but given that the UK will no longer be part of, of the UP, UP system, the other member states need to decide what's going to happen with, with that seat of the court um, going forward. Yes. Um, it's not something we're As part I'm a of, chemist, no. I would love to travel to the UK, <laughs> uh, to London, for the proceedings. So I would love the seat to, be, to stay in London, well, but I don't know as well. There are lots of other good reasons to come to London. So, you know, uh, <laughs> of course. Uh, and uh, uh, as, yeah. we're leaving the EU, but we still have uh, um, uh, strong ties with, with Europe and you know, is a really important um, relationship for us. So, uh, yep, we look forward to seeing you in the UK. That won't change. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> So I have another very specific question um, that I was asked uh, before this interview. Um, so let us assume the following. Uh, next year, one of our clients wants to oppose a trademark in the UK based on an earlier uh, European trademark, um, which has then spawned a UK trademark um, <coughs> by 1st of January. And then the question would be, will the use of the earlier trademark, for example in Germany, the earlier EU trademark, be sufficient for proof of use um, in these opposition proceedings? Um, or is it necessary for the newly created opposing UK trademark to have been used in the UK by then? Now you get into the real technical details for me. So, of course, uh, um, that is a very uh, tricky question. It's a very tricky me. question, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful. I've got a, a, a fantastic team of people that uh, um, you know, know all this detail because uh, you know, um, if it was left to me, that would be much harder. Um, I think that it's a really important question, um, and you know, certainly considering any sort of any period before the first of January. Um, though things would be taken into account, so if you know the sort of the, the I think the five year period um, for for looking at sort of use and things like that, any period before the first of January twenty twenty one in Europe would be taken into account. So your example in Germany, you know, if um, you know a period of that time it, it's been used in Germany, that could be used as part of proof of of use of trademark um, after the first of January. Things will, will will be different. So you know, as long as that five year period has a, an element of it before the first of January, then things will be taken into account. Um, you know, uh, going forward though, that's something that people need to to think around um, it, yes. and, and and come into effect. Well, that is very generous. Um, thank you so much for that information. Very helpful and a very generous solution. I'm grateful for that. <laughs> well, yeah. That's, so um, it, yeah, it's yeah, trying to make it make the make the system you know work for everybody, um, and yes. uh, you know I think that's that's important, and, and ultimately saying look, you know the the IP system is is you know fundamental to the way all our economies work, and making sure that you know um, that carries on is is really key. Uh, the UK has a great IP system, and will continue to have a great IP system. You know, um, just some of the relationships change, and uh, we want to make that transition as smooth as possible for everybody. Um, I'm sure there will be certain things that. Uh, you know, unforeseen circumstances that may crop up. But as I said, the aim is to, to make things work for, for all our customers to ensure that business and trademarks and IP can work effectively. 
Yes. Um, before we um, go into the, uh, b because uh, your time is very valuable, um, I have one uh, question not regarding Brexit. <laughs> so um, I found out on your website that you have a trademark pre-application tool using AI. That is uh, that uh, sparked my interest. So. Um, can you tell me more about this tool? Uh, certainly. Um, in fact, I was uh, sitting with the team the other day having a demonstration of, of this great new tool uh, and how it operates. Um, it's you know um, AI is is one of the new uh, one of a number of new technologies that we're using. Um, I think it's it's a fascinating area for IP, um, not just in terms of how offices can use AI, but also some of the big questions that AI is posing for the IP framework. Um, in fact, the UK offices just. Uh, just had a just closed a call for views um, from across the industry to, to uh, and sectors to, to say what are the big questions of affecting uh, IP that AI is posing from you know authorship inventorship ownership these sort of things but in terms of our new tool that we've we, we've launched in fact we've got two one is a customer pre-apply tool and one is an examiner assist tool um, and on the customer pre-apply tool this is really uh, um, trying to help people to improve their applications to look at some of the issues that uh, that that uh, their application might might have and to give them a, a greater chance of success um, so you know it, it's a great use of AI um, and it sort of it certainly helps to educate customers and especially first-time applicants you know, who might find that the process a bit daunting um, there's an interactive classification picker um, which helps to identify the goods and services that a customer might want to protect um, and then we, we have some AI powered search tools um, that look for similar trademarks um, both from an image and also from a text searching and a combined perspective. So um, really using some, some great AI algorithms to, to look at the, uh, those things. Um, and the checks also give customers an idea of, of potential app objections and uh, issues around that, um, especially things like offensive words or protective symbols. So it's all aimed to try and help people get it right. Um, and also to give them a, a sort of a summary of you know, what the next steps would be, how much it might cost um, and, and what they need to do. Um, and then our examiner assist tool is using similar sort of algorithms to then improve the searching capability around text and image searching, again, to help examiners you know, process the applications you know, um, quicker and more efficiently and effectively. Um, so really exciting stuff. Um, and we're looking forward to see how that develops and, and to look at saying how well the customer pre-apply tool will actually help to improve the, the success rate for customers, um, which is what this is all about. Yes, wow, that's really exciting to hear. Um, you are far ahead of uh, many offices in this regard. <laughs> well, the, the, the team have done some fantastic work, and I think you know it, it's certainly not look, not uh, looking to replace the really important work that trademark attorneys do and the, the profession. It's there to help educate customers and and help them get it right, but it's improve the whole end to end process of uh, applying for a trademark and, and make it easier and simple, which is what it should all be about. Well, yes, uh, and also the tr trademark and patent attorneys uh, like myself, uh, they need to face reality. I mean, AI is becoming stronger and uh, some uh, fields of their work will change and uh, some others will stay the same. So uh, I'm very realistic. I have to face reality. <laughs> well, it, it, AI is going to impact all our lives. Uh, it is every day right. from you know uh, us using Alexa or um, you know uh, Siri or other bits and pieces on our phones to to the way that you know we, there are chatbots in in contact centres. It's impacting every every aspect of our lives, and it's really important that uh, I think the IP world both embraces it as the tools, but also looks at some of the the the, 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 the big questions um, that that AI you know especially as it starts creating things, inventing things, doing things. You know, at what point does it challenge right. the big questions um, uh, uh, that are fundamental to the IP system? Um, and I think it's really exciting and certainly something that uh, we're discussing with many other offices um, across the world. Yes, and the UK courts were also in a forerunner in uh, decisions about whether um, AI can be inventor or not. Yes. I, I remember very well. <laughs> uh, yes, um, yes so. some important applications. <laughs> but I said it just represents the big questions. And I think it's something that you know, the, right. the profession and uh, the offices really need to, to look at and think, what does the future hold? Um, and ensuring that the IP framework is fit for purpose um, for future technologies, of which AI is just one. Right. So, um, so where can people, where can our listeners go if they want to find the definite answers regarding Brexit and what they need to know and what they need to do about their patents, trademarks, design, and copyright? Um, 
do you have like one single address where you can send them? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, the, 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 the first place people should go would be to the IPO website. Um, and we've got a specific guide on there in terms of entitled intellectual property after the 1st of January 2021 and uh, various things around sort of the, the impact of the end of the transition period um, and the, UK's, the UK leaving the EU. So it's on our, our website. It's the, the gov.uk website. Um, and if you put in intellectual property after the 1st of January 2021, you'll get the, get the guide. So gov.uk, intellectual property, intellectual property office, you'll, you'll find it that way. So... Uh, um, yeah, please do look at it. There, we've also run various events and other communications. So um, please, you know, if you've got any questions at all, start with the website um, and then get in touch. Yes, your guides are very helpful and you have excellent videos uh, that explain everything. So I'm very grateful that you that your website is so informative. <laughs> oh, thank you. I said the team have done some fantastic work, but it is hugely important. And I think, you know, very, very much would recommend people getting the message out for people to, to make sure they understand what the changes mean for them. Um, we can give, you know, standard guidance for everybody, but people really need to understand what's the impact on, on, on their clients, on their businesses, etc. It's a big, important change. Um, uh, and uh, let's make sure we're all prepared. Well, thank you very much for, for your time and for being on the show. No, it's great. Lovely to talk to you again, Ralph. Uh, all the very best and thank you for inviting me back. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at ipfridays.com or on iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at ipfridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to ipfridays.com slash iTunes and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.